We are coming on the air with multiple headlines on multiple wars. And any second now, we expect to see President Biden perhaps talk about both. He will be joined by the Ukrainian leader. And the timing is crucial here, with Congress set to go home for the rest of the year at the end of the week. How that could play out as it relates to aid to Ukraine based on the conversations we've heard today. Plus, a trial for former Congressman George Santos may be coming as soon as next fall, according to what a federal judge told him in court today. Well, we now know about negotiations to perhaps avoid that by settling for a plea deal instead. Then the future of a nearly 160-year-old abortion ban in Arizona now in the hands of the state Supreme Court. How the judges are weighing whether to keep that Civil War era law. And an advocacy group putting pressure on the FDA to put out stronger warnings about Botox. Why the group says current claims and labels for Botox could be misleading. And a record-setting deal for one of the biggest players in Major League Baseball. Why it may not be all it's cracked up to be. We'll explain that later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, live from Tel Aviv with this war between Israel and Hamas and another, of course, making headlines back home in Washington, starting with that Russian invasion of Ukraine. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, set to join President Biden any second here. And in fact, it looks as though we are getting close to that very news conference. We'll take you now to a special report from NBC News. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good afternoon, everyone. We're coming on the air with breaking news at the White House, where President Biden and Ukrainian President Zelensky are holding a joint news conference. It comes as the two leaders try to convince Congress to continue funding for Ukraine as the war with Russia approaches the two-year mark in February. Let's take you to that news conference now, just getting underway. Today, again today, nearly two years later, and for Ukraine to be stand strong and free is an enormous victory already. Putin has failed, failed his effort to subjugate Ukraine. The brave people of Ukraine have defied Putin's will at every turn, backed by the strong and unwavering support of the United States and our allies and partners of more than 50 nations, 50 nations in Europe and the Indo-Pacific. And Ukraine will emerge from this war proud, free, and firmly rooted in the West unless we walk away. The American people can be and should be incredibly proud of the part they played in supporting Ukraine's success. We'll continue to supply Ukraine with critical weapons and equipment as long as we can, including $200 million I just approved today in a critical needed equipment, additional air defense interceptors, artillery, and ammunition. But without supplemental funding, we're rapidly coming to an end of our ability to help Ukraine respond to the urgent operational demands that it has. Putin is banking on the United States failing to deliver for Ukraine. We must, we must, we must prove him wrong. The United States and Congress must, as I asked last week, and this, it's stunning that we've gotten to this point. You know, we need to fully appreciate fully appreciate how it's wrong, how this is being viewed around the world and being used by Russia. Russian loyalists in Moscow celebrated when, re when Republicans voted to block Ukraine's aid last week. The host of a Kremlin-run show literally said, and I quote, well done, Republicans. That's good for us, end of quote. Let me say that again. This host of a Kremlin-run show said, well done, Republicans. That's good for us. That's a Russian speaking. If you're being celebrated by Russian propagandists, it might be time to rethink what you're doing. History, history will judge harshly those who turn their back on freedom's cause. Today, Ukraine's freedom is on the line. But if we don't stop Putin, it will endanger the freedom of everyone almost everywhere. Putin will keep going, and would-be aggressors everywhere will be emboldened to try to take what they can by force. Mr. President, I'll not walk away from Ukraine, and neither will the American people. A clear bipartisan majority of people across the United States and in Congress support your country. They understand, as I do, that Ukraine's success and its ability to deter aggression in the future are vital to security for the world at large. And I have repeatedly made clear from our first day in office 
We also need Ukraine to make changes to fix the broken immigration system here. We also need Congress to make the changes to fix the broken immigration system here at home. My team is working with Senate Democrats and Republicans to try to find a bipartisan compromise, both in terms of changes in policy and provide the resources we need to secure the border. Compromise is how democracy works, and I'm ready and offered compromise already. Holding Ukraine funding hostage in the attempt to force through an extreme Republican partisan agenda on the border is not how it works. We need real solutions. I also ask Congress for funding for Israel to take on Hamas and confront multiple other threats backed by Iran in the wake of the October 7th assault. National Security Advisor Sullivan will travel to the region this week and meet with the Israeli War Cabinet, as I have met with, to emphasize our commitment to Israel, as well as the need to protect civilian life and ensure more humanitarian assistance flows and reaches into Gaza for Palestinian civilians. Secretary Austin will also travel to the region this week to step up the international efforts to protect the free flow of commerce through the Red Sea. The entire world is watching what we do. So let's show them who we are. America stands for freedom today, tomorrow, and always. America stands against tyranny and against oppression. And America stands with the people of Ukraine. Thank you again for being here today, Mr. President, and thank you for everything Ukraine is doing to hold the line for liberty in the world. The floor is yours, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. President, dear journalists. I'm glad to be here and personally thank you and tell you how Ukraine knows what we've achieved together, defending life and freedom. In Ukraine, we are fighting for our country and freedom, and also in Europe, we say for our freedom and yours. And this motto resonates not only in our country, not only in our hearts, not only in Ukraine, but also in Poland and Baltic states, Moldova and others. When freedom is strong in one country, it is strong everywhere. When it burns in one soul, it presents its merits to, to others. Ukrainians have twice, Ukrainians have twice led revolutions this century, defending freedom. For nearly two years, we have been in a full-scale war, the biggest, the biggest since World War II, fighting for freedom. We stand firm, no matter what Putin tries, he hasn't won any victories. Thanks to Ukraine's success, success in defense, other European nations are safe from the Russian aggression, unlike in the past. Ukraine can now tackle the Russian dictatorship, so our children and other nations won't have to shed their blood and sacrifice lives defending against Russian aggression. We've already made significant progress We've shown that our courage and partnership are stronger than any Russian hostility. And we have freed 50% of the territories Russia occupied after February 24th. And we've won the Black Sea and are reviving our economy. Thanks to maritime experts, Ukraine's 5% economic growth this year proves our effective partnership. And we've shown no, no Russian missiles can overdoor the powerful American Patriot systems. Thank you very much. And even during war, we are reforming our country and strengthening our, our institutions. Today, President Biden and I discussed how to increase our strength for next year, first air defense and destroying Russian logistics on Ukraine's land. Mr. President, thank you very much for your supporting, supporting us. And in these areas, like our victory in the Black Sea, we aim to win the air battle, crashing Russian air dominance. This will, this will intensify our ground advances 
in 2024 with our control of the skies. Who controls the skies controls the war's duration. And today I would like to thank, of course, for yet another significant defense package with our defenders value very much. Second, yesterday I met with American, American defense company leaders. They advised us on how to make our defense industries work faster and more effectively. Thank you, President Biden, for this important initiative. We started with you. Together, Ukraine and America can strengthen democracy's arsenal. And this is vital for other free nations and the U.S. as it involves your companies, technologies, and technology advancement and job creation. And it is important to know that two-thirds of American support for Ukraine remains and works in the United States. Third, I informed Mr. President that Ukraine has fulfilled all the recommendations of the European Commission regarding the preparation for a decision to start negotiations on Ukraine's accession to the uh, EU. And we constantly communicate with European leaders about our joint steps, sanctions, and political efforts to pressure Russia. American leadership is crucial, is keeping this unity together, a unity that serves the entire free world. And I thank America for new sanctions. And today we discussed Putin's further isolation and making him pay for his aggression. It's very important that by the end of this year, we can send very strong signal of our unity to the aggressor and the unity of Ukraine, America, Europe, the entire free world. Everything we talked about today will help us in the year 2024. Today's discussions in the White House and in Congress across both parties and both chambers with a speaker were very productive. And I thank you for the bipartisan support. As we approach Christmas, on behalf of all or our Ukrainian families, separated by war and all sons and daughters on the front, Ukraine's greatest wish is to near this war's victorious end. No one, no one but Putin wants, wants a prolonged war. We dream of a Christmas in a peacetime, of course, and we are working to turn our battlefield success into peace. And we are heading there together with you and thanks, of course, to your support. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, America. Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Look, uh, we're going to alternate asking questions. We're going to ask a total of each ask two questions. And I will ask the first question. Uh, I will ask. I will recognize the first question asker. <laughs> I'll ask a question to all, too. But um, uh, Danny Kemp. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, for President Biden, um, Ukraine's counteroffensive has, uh, has stalled in recent months. Uh, Congress is blocking aid, uh, and Vladimir Putin appears ready to just wait things out. Um, so what is the strategy for the U.S. and Ukraine next year to try and turn this, uh, turn this around? And if that fails, uh, at what point do you say to Ukraine, as a friend, uh, that it is perhaps time to start looking at peace talks? And for President Zelensky, um, welcome back to Washington. Um, can I ask you, did you uh, hear what you wanted to hear from Congress and from President Biden? Um, and uh, or are you indeed more worried than when you got here? Thank you very much. Well, let me uh, answer the question first. Let's put this in perspective. Remember how far Ukraine has come. Russia has failed, failed us far in trying to erase Ukraine from the map and uh, subsume it into Russia. Ukraine has taken back more than 50 percent of its territory seized since February of 22. And it's pushed back Russian, the, the Russian Navy so Ukraine can export grain and steel to the world through the Black Sea. And thanks to the incredible courage of the Ukrainian people and the bipartisan support from our Congress, but it's not just American support. There are more than 50 countries, 
50 countries helping Ukraine with military, economic, and humanitarian assistance. 50. The burden sharing, the U.S. has put up $75 billion, and our allies and partners have put up $100 billion. And more than 90 percent of our security assistance to Ukraine is being spent in the United States to provide weapons for Ukraine and replenish our stockpiles and build our industrial base. We need to ensure Putin continues to fail in Ukraine and Ukraine to succeed. And the best way for that to, to do that is to pass the supplemental. Yeah. Yeah. Can I answer in Ukrainian, please? <clears throat> Thank you. First of all, I would like to add uh, to the words of Mr. President uh, Biden uh, uh, about successes. I think that uh, these were not easy successes. Nonetheless, they were quite serious. There were serious steps forward. Indeed, we gained victory on the sea. We destroyed ships of the Russian Federation. We throw the remnants of their fleet to Russian territorial waters. Yes, they uh, have something uh, in the Black Sea uh, in the vicinity of our temporarily occupied Crimea, but we are going to proceed this activity. Now, we guys destroyed 20,000 of Wagner mercenaries. These are serious terrorists who were massing everywhere on African continent, in Syria, in Ukraine. There were a lot of mass and nucleus of this terroristic organization is not existing anymore. Yes, we had a lot of uh, problems, but nonetheless we were able to do this. Moreover, Russia were not able to seize uh, any part of our territory, any village, any town. I'm not talking about large cities. And we are going to proceed with this. It is good without saying that we have objective, we have clear plan, but if you allow me, I am not able to tell you in public uh, on the details of 2024 operations. If I heard what I want, I've heard a lot. Surely I told what I wanted to. I feel and experience this support from President Biden administration, uh, from senators, and we've been talking with the speaker. I got this signal. They were more than positive, but we know that we have to separate world and particular result. Therefore, we will count on particular result. Thank you. Your turn to ask a question. Yeah, sorry. Telekanal Inter, please. Inter, please. Oh, thank you for taking my question. Dmitry Anopchenko, Ukrainian television U.S. correspondent. Uh, many Republican voices doubt the ability of Ukraine to win the war. Uh, Center once uh, recently even told that Ukraine need to cede some territories to stop fighting. Pane Volodymyre, uh, to be very honest, have you even considered the, such a step to cede the territories to stop fighting? And Mr. Biden, could you please clarify the policy and of your administration, the strategy of your administration on Ukraine? Is it about helping the country to defend itself or to win the war? Because it's obviously such a difference. I will begin. Okay. So, first question to me. So, uh, do, your question is, if we are ready to give up our territories? Mm. The question is not only about our words or thoughts. The question is about for what we are ready and for what we are not. How? Ukraine is able to give up its territories. That's insane, to be honest. We are mentioning God very often. That's not about Christianity. We have our people there. We have our families there. We have children there. That's part of Ukrainian society. And we are talking about human beings. They are being under tortures. They are being raped. And they are being killed. And those voices which offers to give up our territories, they offers as well to give up our people. That's not a matter of territory. That's a matter of lives, of families 
of children of their histories. I don't know whose idea it is, but I have a question to these people if they are ready to give up their children to terrorists. I think no. We want to see Ukraine win the war. And uh, as I've said before, winning means Ukraine is a sovereign, independent nation and uh, that can afford to defend itself today and deter further aggression. That's our objective. Uh, Trevor Reuters. Reuters. Thank you, sir. Um, first, a question for both of you. Um, Given the Republican skepticism of the Ukraine effort, do you worry that a second term for President Trump would be the uh, end of an independent Ukraine? That's for both of you. And then for you, uh, Pres President Biden, um, just an update, if you could, on the, the situation in Gaza, uh, on the reports that Israel has begun flooding Hamas tunnels, um, and just the, the offensive in southern Ga Gaza generally, how long do you think that operation should last? Thank you. First of all, with regard to uh, political support for Ukraine, there is a strong bipartisan political support for Ukraine. Small number of Republicans who don't want to support Ukraine, but uh, they don't speak for the majority, of even the Republicans, in my view. We're in negotiations <clears throat> to get funding we need, not to promise, uh, not, not making promises, but hopeful we can get there. I think we can. You're right. The world's watching what we do. We just send a horrible message to an aggressor and allies if we walked away at this time. And it would hurt our national security. Do you want me to answer the other question as well? With regard to... Want to say it again. Sorry. So the, the question was just um, if you could talk a little bit about the Gaza operation, Israel flooding Hamas tunnels, and if you've had conversations with uh, Bibi Netanyahu about how long that operation should last. Well, I have had conversations with Bibi Netanyahu, and, uh, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, we don't forget uh, what we're doing here. We have to support Israel because they're an independent nation that's being I mean, the brutality, the inhumanity, the way in which Hamas treated <clears throat> the Israelis and, I mean, raping and burning and beheading. I mean, it's just, it's just beyond comparison, beyond comparison. And uh, to anything else that I've seen since I've been here, and I've been around for a long time. But I think that uh, we have made it clear to the Israelis, and they're aware, that the independent, the, the safety of innocent Palestinians is still of great concern. And so the actions they're taking must be consistent with attempting to do everything possible to prevent innocent Palestinian civilians from being, being hurt, murdered, killed, lost, etc. And uh, look, um, it doesn't uh, lessen their responsibility going after Hamas to innocent Palestinians and, and, uh, and Hamas. Uh, look, we have a responsibility to protect citizens and ensure they have access to humanitarian assistance. That's why I've worked so hard with our Arab friends as well as the Israelis to get humanitarian assistance into Israel, literally getting up to 140 trucks loaded with gear, loaded with food, loaded with everything that is needed by the Palestinians, including fuel. So, you know, Israel has stated its intent to fulfill these responsibilities. Uh, it's very difficult. With regard to the flooding of the tunnels, uh, I'm not a liber Well, there is assertions being made that there's quite sure there are no hostages in any of these tunnels. Uh, but I don't know that for a fact. I do know that, though, every civilian death is an absolute tragedy, and Israel stated its intent, as I said, to, uh, to match its, uh, its words with uh, its intent with, word, with actions. That's why, uh, that's, why I was, that's why I was talking about today. Question three. I uh, guess I asked that. No, I just asked that. It's your My turn. turn. Your turn. Yeah. 
So, uh, addressing your question very quickly, uh, I've been talking a lot with representatives of both parties. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, proved uh, full pledged support. And we will see, but before this, we've always been trusting in support of our strategic partner, the United States, and we will consider that it will continue in this way, and Ukraine will not remain alone against such a critical terrorist as the Russian Federation. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Dovipol, Ukraine Forum News Agency, Ukraine. Next summer, uh, the United States will host uh, uh, an anniversary NATO summit, summit in Washington, D.C., which, which raises a lot of hope, especially for Ukraine. Uh, President Zelensky, uh, what does the Ukrainian side expect from this summit? And uh, do you hope to hear direct invitation for Ukraine to join the alliance? <coughs> and uh, President Biden, under what conditions is the United States ready to support the initiative of inviting Ukraine to be member member of NATO? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I will answer very quickly on this very complicated question. We are not allies till now. We are, not we, we are allies, but we are not members, members of NATO. So that's why I think I will pass this question to <laughs> our big friend, <laughs> President Biden. Look, I'm very proud that <laughs> how strong and unified NATO has become. And now it's even larger. I, uh, Putin wanted the finalization of NATO when I met with him in, uh, in, uh, in, in Geneva right after I was elected. And he's gotten the NATOization of Finland instead. And NATO will be in Ukraine's future, no question about that. But we, as we said in Vilnius, Ukraine will become a member of NATO when all allies agree and conditions are met. Right now, we may have to make sure they win the war. And, uh, you know, we launched a joint declaration of support alongside President Zelensky and the G7 leaders in Vilnius, outlining a long-term commitment to supporting Ukraine's defense needs. We also hosted a defense industry conference last week here in D.C. to get that critical work done. So it's a step at a time. Thank you all very, very much. This concludes the con Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the press conference. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Distinguished guests, please remain in your seats while the principals depart. And uh, President Biden and President Zelensky completing their joint news conference now, not taking any questions, being shouted by reporters. The focus of this uh, press conference and, in fact, their meetings is on continuing U.S. aid into Ukraine and its war uh, with Russia now close to two years. It'll be two years in February. Let's go straight to senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez, who had a seat in this news conference. Conference. Uh, what stood out to you, Gabe? Uh, hi there, Lester. Well, um, this is a very different uh, reception in Washington that President Zelensky got today as opposed to a year ago when he arrived here essentially to a hero's welcome. President Zelensky arriving uh, at a political buzzsaw President moment Zelensky on Capitol Hill with things. Republicans yeah, deeply of all, skeptical of sending any more money Ukraine. to uh, Ukraine. Of course, uh, the president and the Biden administration has been asking for $106 billion in extra funding, not just for Ukraine. Ukraine, but also support to Israel and for fortifying border security. Well, you just heard here President Zelensky being asked questions about a strategy moving forward. And over the past several days, several Republicans have floated the idea whether it might be the case that uh, Ukraine uh, might have to consider ceding some territory to Russia. Well, President Zelensky is defiant as ever, saying that that was insane, in his words, to be honest. And President Biden making the case that this money is necessary. Now, earlier today, 
Wednesday, President Biden also announced $200 million, million dollars, excuse me, in new aid that had been previously approved in ammunition and other military aid being sent to Ukraine. But the Biden administration has been repeatedly saying that much more is necessary. Still, Lester, deep skepticism from Republicans who on Capitol Hill have been arguing that they want to see more accountability for how this money is being spent, and they want to see a clearer strategy uh, being articulated by both Ukrainian and U.S. officials. Now, according to uh, newly declassified intelligence, uh, U.S. officials say that over the past uh, several months since October that the Russians have uh, suffered 13,000 casualties, and they argue that if um, if this is not, uh, if this money is not approved for Ukraine, that this could um, allow Russia to be able to have a stronger position going into the new year. But the president making his case once again that he is unified with President Zelensky and again making the case that uh, lawmakers on Capitol Hill should approve this Ukraine funding. But the latest we're hearing from the Hill last year is that it is unlikely to happen this week or even next as lawmakers are heading home for the holidays and these negotiations could drag on into January. Lester. Ed Gutierrez, thank you very much. Let's bring in our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons. He joins us live from Moscow, where clearly they're watching and paying very close attention to this. Keir? That's right, Lester. President Biden said that the world will be watching. Certainly it's after 1 a.m. here in uh, Moscow, but I think some lights will be on in the Kremlin uh, watching uh, that news conference. In fact, the Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, making clear today that they would be watching closely President Zelensky's uh, visit uh, to Washington, saying in Dmitry Peskov's words that why would America spend tens of billions of more dollars on Ukraine, saying it won't change the battlefield. Field. I think it's absolutely clear that the Russian government would like to see that money uh, not spent. President Putin now looking towards an election next year, uh, looking towards trying to be more on the world stage, visiting Saudi Arabia uh, just this month. The polls, uh, the in some independent polls here in Russia suggesting many Russian people more and more want to see some kind of peace talks. That kind of talk was dismissed at the news conference uh, there, Lester. And I think uh, the reality is that any negotiations would be very unlikely to involve Russia agreeing to cede territory territory in Ukraine, and that, of course, is something that President Zelensky would never accept. Lester? I'll ask you to stand by. Thanks. I'm going to go back to Gabe Gutierrez. Gabe, the, the president also spoke on another topic, that is the war in Israel, specifically the Israeli plan to flood tunnels with seawater. What did the president say, and what do we know about that? Oh, that's right, Lester. Well, that had said that was something that had been discussed by Ukrainian and Israeli officials over the last several days. And uh, the president, um, you know, saying just a few moments ago um, that um, the, the there have been reports earlier today and a U.S. official had confirmed that uh, the Israelis had begun to start flooding those tunnels in Gaza. Now, uh, the president says that he had been told that there had been uh, no hostages in those uh, tunnels at this point, but he wasn't sure that that was the case. But Lester, this comes after a rift between um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Biden. Uh, they've uh, long had a, a somewhat contentious relationship. Well, that is now spilling out into public view because at a fundraiser earlier today, the president uh, dis describing um, how he was worried that Israel could lose a public support by what he called indiscriminate bombing on the part of Israel. So certainly that is uh, something to watch going forward, this relationship between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden as uh, the Israeli operation in Gaza continues. All right, Gabe, thanks. And now to a colleague who has recently covered both of these wars. Let me bring in Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel. He's in Jerusalem right now, but uh, let me ask you first about what's, uh, what we saw here a moment ago. President Zelensky clearly pushing back the idea that this could be a negotiated settlement, some kind of a peace treaty. Is that a position, in your view, he'll be able to sustain for a long time? Well, he had a very harsh reality check this year. Uh, when President Zelensky used to come to the United States, he would get standing ovations and walk away with billions of dollars in aid packages. Uh, now he has had a, 
a summer offensive that was supposed to be a spring offensive became a summer offensive that didn't produce much more than gridlock. He's running low on ammunition and he's walking away at this stage with a quite a limited aid package, $200 million, mostly air defenses as uh, Ukraine goes into the harsh winter. And every winter, Russia has been bombing the infrastructure in Ukraine, trying to cut off the heat. So uh, he has a long road ahead. Whether Ukraine will have to give up territory is something that the Ukrainian people and President Zelensky are going to have to decide. Can they continue this war? Can they keep it going without making any rapid advances? Uh, also difficult uh, discussion on, on Israel. We, we heard a lot from President Biden uh, talking about the brutality of Hamas. He did call on Israel to uh, continue to protect civilians or do uh, its utmost to protect civilians, but it comes amid a growing international wave of condemnation uh, with uh, international aid organizations condemning everything that Israel is doing now, describing the humanitarian situation as uh, apocalyptic. And uh, he didn't reference the fact that the U.S. has vetoed uh, recent uh, U.N. Security Council proposals calling for a ceasefire. So uh, on both fronts, I think we're seeing the United States struggling to, to maintain support for, the, for, these, for these two wars. Richard Engel. Richard, thank you. That concludes this NBC News special report. We'll have much more ahead tonight on Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. Thank you for watching. I'm Hallie Jackson in Tel Aviv, one of two regions, one of two wars making a lot of headlines tonight around the world. You've just been watching that NBC News special report. President Biden there alongside the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, trying to make the case to Congress back home in Washington for more aid, more money for Ukraine's war with Russia. It comes at the same time that President Biden is talking about the war between Israel and Hamas, saying that while he supports Israel's fight against Hamas, his administration has made it clear to the Israelis that the safety of innocent Palestinians is still of great concern. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who is outside the White House for us, watching all of this here and a lot of headlines on both of these fronts. Aaron, let's start with the Israeli front uh, as we are here covering this particular war. One of the things we heard from President Biden and you heard Richard and Keir and Gabe talk about some of the some of the takeaways. Top officials are headed back to the region now. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, uh, Jake Sullivan, his top national security official. Should we be reading that, Aaron, as an indication that perhaps there is going to be a push to try to get those talks related to hostage negotiations open back up? And, and talk, too, about the humanitarian push as well that the U.S. is making, particularly from a U.S. official looking to get more aid trucks through a separate border crossing now. Yeah, I think in short, the, the announcement that these two leaders, these two senior administration officials are going back to the region is is exactly what you said. It's an indication that the administration is, is starting to ramp up again its efforts to try to restart these negotiations about the release of hostages. We know that uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, was a key figure in the crafting of the original mm. truce and the original deal to get hostages uh, released by Hamas. But at the same time, we know that Secretary Austin, the Secretary of Defense, was a key player in that as well, talking to his counterparts about uh, what the U.S. could do and how he could help the Israelis with their effort to defeat Hamas and set up the, a posture where there could be a greater effort made around getting hostages released. And so having Secretary Austin going back to Israel and to Qatar and to Bahrain uh, are, are, it really is an indication that uh, the Defense Department is going to re, uh, reignite those efforts with the presence of a top leader. And Jake Sullivan going back to that region as well, planning to go to Israel, I think is an indicator that uh, this is now going to be a top-level official going in to try to get these talks restarted. There's not a lot of hope, I have to tell you, Hallie, that uh, that is going to happen. There, there's been a continued effort by the people who are stationed in that region uh, from the Biden administration to try to get those talks restarted. The Qataris have indicated they've wanted to do that as well, but it's not something that has uh, looked like it was going to happen in the short term anyway, as Israel has continued to uh, make these movements in the southern part of Gaza in the last couple of weeks here, Hallie. 
Yeah. I'll tell you who does have hope, of course, that these releases could happen or that talks pick back up. Family members of hostages who have been taken by Hamas. I spoke with one person whose cousin was kidnapped who said, all I have is hope because otherwise, he says, how can I wake up in the morning? We also are seeing these headlines now from that news conference from President Zelensky alongside President Biden pushing for aid. But Aaron, as you well know, this international issue has been caught up in a domestic political issue with Republicans, of course, linking that package to border funding here. They are running out of time. They are up against kind of a self-imposed deadline to get something done. What are the chances anything actually does? Well, it's not looking good at this point, Hallie. We've heard from the, the key negotiators on the issue of border security saying that they don't anticipate that there's going to be a deal uh, uh, agreed to and written and ready to be voted on by the end of this week when the legislature Congress is expected to be leaving for the holiday break. At the same time, we've heard from the Republican and Democrat who are leading this effort that they are going to continue to talk, that there have been uh, sort of incremental steps taken toward progress here, but they don't expect that there's going to be something to vote on in the short term that could change. We know how these things happen on the Hill. That could change and potentially we sure. could see members called back to Washington for some sort of a vote, but there's not a high degree of confidence that that will happen. Um, and, and you mentioned the fact that both Ukraine and Israel aid are tied to that particular issue. The Biden administration put forth this supplemental request uh, that, that talked about $60, million, $60 billion for Ukraine, $6 billion for border security, and another $14 billion for Israel. It's all tied together, and as, as it seems at this point, Hallie, it all has to move together if any of it's going to move. Aaron Gilchrist, if it does, I know you'll be watching it there for us from Washington. Thank you very much. Also in Washington tonight is my friend and colleague Tom Costello, who's picking up with a lot of other news happening tonight, Tom. Tons of headlines happening back home, right? Yeah, that's right. Busy day. Hallie, we'll check back with you at the top of the hour. Thank you. To the economy we go now, and new data out today shows inflation is holding steady, not getting any worse. The good news? Gas prices are down, along with what economists call core goods, goods and services other than food and energy. But a rise in shelter costs, think rent, think mortgages, and used car prices, they made up for decreases in those other categories. All right, here's the data point. The November inflation rate, 3.1%, is a huge improvement from its peak. That was back at 9% in June of 22. Christine Romans is joining us now. Christine, talk us through this report. Sure. This is the 34,000-foot view of the economy, <laughs> but not all consumers are seeing the good news firsthand. Certainly, and it will take time for cooling inflation to really be felt in family budgets because, remember, this has been a year and a half of what has been inflation issue number one for American families. So 3.1%. Obviously, that's an improvement from the worst of it above 9%, but 3.1% is still inflation on top of inflation, right? These are still rising prices overall. And you're right to mention, Tom, that shelter inflation. That's something that has been very sticky, as the economists say. But look, eggs from November last year to this year, an improvement. Gasoline, certainly an improvement. And you have 23 states tonight that have gas below $3 a gallon. So that's important for sentiment and for budgets. Milk, uh, also a little bit cooler. But bread, you're seeing some of the some of the things in the grocery aisle that are, are moving up. Overall, the food category, the food category rising a little bit um, still month to month. But you can see energy there is where the relief has been, Tom. Yeah, I was in Florida yesterday, paid less than $3 a gallon. I thought, well, this yeah. is nice uh, for a change. But listen, let's drill down on something you said, right? It's inflation on top of inflation. Because I looked up the number this afternoon, and a year ago, we were looking at 7% inflation year over year in November. Yep. Now we're at 3.1% year over year. So cumulatively, we're up 10% right. over two years just in November. People feel that. That's real to them. And that's the disconnect between economists and wonks like me who say the inflation rate is, the, the, the trend is the right thing here. The trend is your friend. The trend is getting better yeah. on inflation. And American families are like, wait a minute. So I'm paying 3.1% on top of the 7% last year. So you're yeah. right. There are, there are inflation rates, Tom, and there are price levels. And the price levels keep moving up for what people are paying for a lot of things. Now, the question is, will you start to see some deflation? The Walmart CEO said on some categories, you're going to see deflation into next year, meaning prices falling. Uh, we are seeing some disinflation which means uh, price is rising more slowly than they have been. So a lot of this is a lot of, you know, econo speak about yeah. going in the right direction.
right direction, trying to engineer a soft landing. But American families in a lot of the polls say they don't feel it. There was a University of Michigan uh, survey on Friday. I'm sure you saw it that uh, the Michigan sentiment spiked 13 percent. It's because people said, hey, gas prices are down and I think the inflation story could get better. So maybe with time, people will start to feel it and believe it. If you're talking the Michigan sentiment, you are getting really wonky. I love it, but it's interesting stuff. Uh, Christine, Christine <laughs> Romans, thanks very I put much. I my That's money in the right. swear jar, the economy I, swear jar. <laughs> I know, I'm into it. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, the trial for rapper Young Thug and five other people is on hold until early next year after one of the defendants was stabbed in Fulton County Jail just a couple of uh, days ago. He was hit multiple times during a fight. The defendants are on trial for racketeering and gang charges. Number two, a man flew from Denmark to Los Angeles without a passport or a ticket. That according to a criminal complaint, he had Russian and Israeli IDs, but it's not clear which citizen he actually, citizenship he has. The suspect says he was confused and could not remember how he managed to board the plane. He could face up to five years in jail if convicted for being a stowaway on an aircraft. Number three, New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu will endorse presidential candidate Nikki Haley tonight, that according to sources close to the governor. The endorsement is uh, key, and it is key in this early voting state. It's a big deal for Haley's candidacy. The two are supposed to appear together for a town hall later this evening. Number four, Ford will cut in half production of its all-electric F-150 Lightning pickup truck next year. The decision comes after the company significantly increased plant capacity for the vehicle this past year. But as you know, EV demand has overall been slower than expected. Number five, is this you? Somebody won $44 million in the Florida lottery, but never showed up to claim the prize. The June 14th drawing expired at midnight. So now what? According to state law, 80% of the money goes directly to the state's education funds, and the rest will go to a pool for future prizes. Former Congressman George Santos is appearing for the first time in court since his historic House expulsion earlier this month, with a judge telling him to gear up for a criminal trial as soon as September of 2024. That, after news broke overnight that prosecutors and Santos's legal team are working towards a plea deal in his case. In a filing, lawyers for the government wrote that plea negotiations are focused on, quote, resolving this matter without the need for a trial. If found guilty at trial, Santos faces potentially dozens of years behind bars after two rounds of charges involving allegations of fraud, money laundering, and identity theft. NBC's Rahima Ellis is on the story for us. Uh, Rahima, based on what we saw today and learned overnight, should we be expecting a plea deal or, or a trial sometime next year? I would think that the Santos team would like a plea deal for all of the things that you just said, Tom, and that is if he's found guilty of these 23 counts that he's facing, he could be behind bars for a very long time. Now, the question becomes one of when could a plea deal come and if it will ever come. You point out that currently this case is scheduled to go to trial in September of next year. The government would very like to speed this up into May or June. However, the defense for George Santos says, hold on a minute, because they've got way too much discovery that's been given to them from the prosecution. They say they've received more than 1.3 million pages of documents that they have to sift to. Sift through. He has one lawyer, but he's bringing in other lawyers to help them. In addition, some of this material has been called sensitive, which means that his client has to be with him when he's going through this. Now, they're trying to get some of that desensitized, if you will, and there's, that's going to happen because it seems the prosecution is agreeing. But the judge said this, George Santos is no longer a congressman and will not be going back and forth to Washington for those kind of, of responsibilities. And he's not behind bars. He's not in custody. So she's thinking that they will have an opportunity to sit, to go through the papers. Whether that means they would be ready for a trial in May or June, that is still not known. But trial is on for September. Now, the other thing we know is that they're coming back in January the 23rd for more status hearing about the nature of where they are in this case. Tom? All right, Rahima, thank you very much. Rahima Ellis in New York. Coming up, why a consumer group is pushing the FDA to put stronger warnings on Botox and similar injections. 
a look at what the risks could be. That's coming up after the break. We're back. NBC covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you can't read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. And this is what they say is going down in the regions. We call this the local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, we're learning more about that seven-story Bronx apartment building collapse that we told you about yesterday. Look at that. Unbelievable. Firefighters say they didn't find anybody trapped in the rubble. Though two people were hurt while evacuating from the building, on-scene commanders say that the debris was 12 feet high in some places. They're investigating what caused the collapse. From our Midwest Bureau, thousands of Catholics are visiting Des Plaines, Illinois for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, honoring the Virgin Mary. The faith will go to a shrine there and make promises. The Archdiocese of Chicago says it's the largest Our Lady of Guadalupe pilgrimage outside of Mexico. And from our Western Bureau, spilled milk is one thing, but spilled eggs might be a next level mess. A delivery truck got into an accident in Washington State and was cracked open, sorry. Eggs tumbled out of it and ended up shutting down part of the state route. Traffic was scrambled. Yeah, I said that. All of it ended up sunny side up. Nobody injured. The road is back open again. They pay me to say that. Tonight, Consumer Advocacy Group Public Citizen is calling for stronger warnings for Botox and other treatments like that. The group has filed a petition with the FDA asking it to require more strict warnings along with the treatments. Letting people know of the risk that comes with them, including a potentially fatal muscle paralyzing disease. Now, folks get these injections for a whole bunch of reasons, erasing wrinkles, treating migraines, even reducing sweating, and they already have a warning on their labels. But this group says it's not enough. We reached out to all of the companies mentioned in the petition for comment so far None of them, make that one of them, sorry, has responded. Merce Ascetics, writing in part that its product is Zeoman, has been FDA approved as a safe and effective treatment for more than a decade. And as always, Merce Ascetics' top priority is ensuring the safety of our products for the patients we serve. Let's bring in Dr. Kavita Patel, who is going to give us some lowdown on this. How dangerous are these products? We've had a debate in the newsroom today. Would you or should you let somebody you know and love close to you, maybe a 20-something, Would you should you let them do this? Tom, I think it depends. So one thing is true, that there are thousands of injuries that come from these injections. And botul like botulinum toxin, Botox injections, yeah. is a toxin that's injected that actually paralyzes the muscle. That's why you get that relaxing of lines, and that's why people use it for wrinkles. But as you mentioned, lots of other medical uses for it. Some are really critical. People who are using it for migraines and other bladder disorders, that is something they critically depend on. So I think we have to separate kind of the medical necessity from times when potentially people don't need it. But we have over 3.6 million Americans using it every year. So this was our discussion today. And, you know, so often people, we, 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 people start going down the road of treatments right. or having some injection or, some, or taking some treatment. Right. And then 10 years later, you find out, There's boy, that was a mistake. Right. Yeah, there are side effects that we didn't know about. Right. So what do, what do you tell your patients? I, I, this is something very common. And I do tell them that when it's done properly by someone trained to do this, and I think that's critical, that it is an incredibly safe procedure, but it is a medical procedure. When it's applied locally, especially for the use in cosmetics, it doesn't get into the system. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what Public Citizen is trying to warn, yeah. that there can be cases where it does get in the system. Uh, I'm aware of a dentist that does this, yeah, offers this right. treatment. He is not a medical doctor, he's a dentist. And right. I'm thinking, boy, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. And it's also gotten popular with younger people it on has. social media. It's kind of gone viral on social media. Yeah, it's licensed and approved for 18 and above. But I know that there are 20-something year olds who have been using it on social media. I think the critical thing here, there's never the right age to use it. It's really about the conversation of the context to use it. Preventing wrinkles is something that a lot of people are trying to pursue, but often just wasting a lot of money for. So yeah. I think that's why we have to make sure that we're using it appropriately. Really, it's done by a trained professional and that you're aware of some of these potential side effects like the muscle para right. paralysis and some of the nerve problems that could come from it. So uh, about the 20-somethings who are doing it, yeah. their argument has been, 
I've had two 20-something daughters who tell me, <laughs> it, you want to get ahead of the curve. You want to get ahead and stop the wrinkles before right. they appear. Right. It's, it's, it's certainly a very, look, as a woman who would love to get ahead of all sorts of processes of aging, I think it's a very valid notion. However, I think that there are times when you're too young for it, and what you're trying to do is identify the time when you can actually prevent that deepening of those lines, mm. which are there. What I tell most patients is those lines were probably there. They were finer than you think. But if you don't have them, do not stress about them and just be happy with what you have and feel good about it. And that's what doctors tell you all the time. And I believe it. <laughs> I like that advice. All right. Yes. Dr. Patel, thank you thank very you. much. We appreciate it. Uh, still to come from us, why baseball superstar Shohei Otani's blockbuster $700 million deal with the Dodgers is not necessarily what it looks like in the headlines. We're getting into the unusual details coming up next. All right, have you heard about this? Uh, that record-setting deal for one of ba the biggest players in baseball ever in the Major League. Well, it's not exactly what it seems. Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Dodgers just reached that stunning agreement for that two-way star to make a whopping $700 million to play for 10 years. But Otani won't see most of that money for another decade. NBC's Noah Pransky is uh, posted uh, at the big board to explain all of this. All right, Noah, break it down for us. The headline doesn't tell the full story. No, I mean, I think we need to start with why this guy will be the highest played, paid player ever. He's basically the second coming of Babe Ruth, a two-way star, all-star pitcher, all-star hitter. And you compare him to Babe Ruth, 701 games into his career, he's got more home runs than Ruth did. He has more pitching strikeouts than Ruth did. Totally impressive two-time MVP player. His contract, though, was equally impressive to baseball insiders because he agreed to defer almost all of his salary. His next 10 years, while he is under contract to the Dodgers, he'll only be making $2 million a year. Now, we should point out he makes a ton of money on endorsements. Set that aside, though, he said, I want my team to have more money to be able to go sign better players. So he deferred the bulk of it. He'll get $68 million a year the 10 years after his deal expires, each one of those years. Now, we also should point out this is interest-free money. So, you know, when you talk to an accountant, when you figure out how he's actually, like how much is this actually worth, it actually is a little closer to $46 million a year over the course of this deal. But still, Tom, not bad money. Wouldn't mind it in my paycheck. I, I don't know how you're going to get by in $46 million <laughs> instead of the original, whatever that right? was, $68 million. Listen, real quickly, I'm all for everybody trying to get whatever they can get, right? But... What do we pay firefighters? What do we pay teachers? What do we pay, for that matter, ER doctors? I mean, this seems out of whack. So the argument is, with so much money pouring into sports, would you rather the money go to the millionaires or the owners, the billionaires? And baseball players say they're just tracking along with the owners. In fact, the average baseball salary, about $5 million a year now, it's doubled in the last 20 years. But the average team value has gone up almost sevenfold in the last 20 years. So the owner's doing just fine and the players keep fighting for a bigger cut. Now, you may say, this is crazy. What can we do so that teachers and firefighters are paid more like athletes? Well, there is something you can do. Local taxpayers, local politicians could stop putting money into pro sports. $33 billion, according to recent research, has gone in the last 50 years to pro stadiums. That's 73% of the cost of basically funding the venues for all of these sports. And it looks like every week, Tom, we see yeah. another city ready to give big time money. Wouldn't you know, just today, the voters in Oklahoma City are going to the polls to decide whether to give close to a billion dollars to their basketball team for a new arena mm -hmm. there. It's your tax money of mine. Noah, thank you very much. Noah Pransky. Sure. That is a wrap for this hour. Uh, as you would expect, the news continues right now. Hallie Jackson in Israel. <laughs> We are coming on the air tonight with Ukraine's leader asking President Biden and the rest of Washington for help in its fight against Russia. How this plea is getting caught up in domestic politics here in the U.S. as time may be running out for a solution. And but President Biden says the Israeli prime minister is losing international support in the other war happening near where I am tonight. Plus, a trial for former Congressman George Santos may be coming as soon as next September, according to what a federal judge told him in court today. What we know about negotiations to maybe avoid that by settling on a plea deal instead. 
that inflation isn't getting worse, but it's also not getting any better, according to new numbers out today. Why, the rest of us may not be feeling it. And a big climate summit in Dubai, overrunning the deadline its host country has set, how leaders are now looking for a way to compromise on the future of fossil fuels. Plus, a big win for the UK's prime minister tonight after a controversial plan to move migrants out of the country survived a key vote. What that means for the plan's future and for the PM who's put a lot on the line for this one. Hey there, I'm Hallie, live from Tel Aviv with the war in this region and another making headlines back home in Washington, starting with that Russian invasion of Ukraine. In just the last hour, you watched it here live on NBC News Now, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, joined President Biden to try to make the case for Congress to get Ukraine the help it needs, the money it needs to fight Russia, saying American leadership is critical in keeping unity among world leaders. Listen. It's very important that by the end of this year, we can send very strong signal of our unity to the aggressor and the unity of Ukraine, America, Europe, the entire free world. But here's the deal. This aid package, this money is essentially stalled in Congress with Republicans using the border crisis in the U.S. as a kind of bargaining chip, while also saying they need some more answers before signing off on more money for a war it seems to have no clear end. Listen to House Speaker Mike Johnson after he met with President Zelensky. We needed clarity on what we're doing in Ukraine and how we'll have proper oversight of the spending of precious taxpayer dollars and the American citizens. And we needed a transformative change at the border. Thus far, we've gotten neither. And the timing here could not be more real because at the end of the week, Congress has plans to try to go home for the rest of the year. The White House says Ukraine is nearly out of money, with Russia now seeming to be stepping up its offensive after a stalemate on the battleground, with its first major attack on the Ukrainian capital in months. Remember that part of this aid package, right, this whole big bill that's stalled in Congress right now, is also helping Israel in its war with Hamas in the region where I am after that terror attack on October 7th. With President Biden giving Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu some of his strongest criticism yet since this war began, saying Israel is losing international support. And just tonight, talking about how the U.S. supports Israel but wants to make sure that there is more done, essentially, to protect innocent Palestinians in Gaza. We are covering this from every angle with Kelly O'Donnell live for us at the White House. Keir Simmons is also traveling internationally. He is live for us from Moscow. Keir, we'll get to you in just a moment. But Kelly, let me start with you here. Democrats accusing Republicans essentially of playing politics with this aid money. We heard that allusion from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer today. We heard President Biden talking about the need to help this ally in Ukraine. Talk us through the takeaways and where you see this going next. Well, certainly the administration is trying to put that pressure on Congress and the urgency of the calendar and the conditions on the ground in Ukraine and wanting to remind people that after all the investment the U.S. has already made, not helping Ukraine now would make all of that invalid if Vladimir Putin was able to succeed in Ukraine. So not acting is, in effect, a benefit to Vladimir Putin now. Here's how the president characterized it. Putin is banking on the United States failing to deliver for Ukraine. We must, we must, we must prove him wrong. So whatever frustrations or questions or weariness that might exist on Capitol Hill, he's trying to invoke again the specter of what is Putin's ambition and what could likely happen if Russia gets more of an advantage. So clearly there's more work to do, there's more negotiating to do, but this visit from President Zelensky is critical in trying to highlight that, while at the same time we're up against things like the holiday schedule and a weariness over negotiating over all of these things, and certainly the U.S. is being called upon to help two allies who are at war with Israel where you are and Ukraine as we've discussed. So it's a lot for the American taxpayer to shoulder, but the administration says both are key priorities. Kelly, we're going to talk more about Israel in just a second. I'm going to ask you to stand by, but here, let me go to you, because one thing we heard from both of these leaders here, both presidents, is the message that this would send to Russia, helping to fund Ukraine in its fight here. So what is the message where you are? What is the message that the Kremlin is getting from this? Oh, well, Hallie, I don't think you need to be able to read between lines to recognize that the Kremlin is hoping uh, that this money is not 
forthcoming. In fact, uh, the Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, saying uh, today, in fact, it's, it's tomorrow now here, it's 2 a.m. In, in Moscow, uh, saying that they will be watching, watching events closely uh, on the Hill and, and in the White House. And I suspect, despite the, the early hours of the morning uh, here, that uh, there are lights on in the Kremlin, uh, because Dmitry Peskov saying in those comments to journalists uh, just uh, some hours ago, trying to make more of that message to say, why would America spend tens of billions of dollars more on a battle that won't change things on the battlefield, uh, he said. I think the issue, though, is that if there is a negotiation, you're not going to see the Kremlin prepared to give up territory. And in the end, this is all about territory. And of course, for President Zelensky, that would be an incredibly difficult, bitter uh, pill to swallow to have to agree to give up some of the Ukrainian territory that, that he has been uh, fighting uh, for. So it, it is a stalemate. In many ways, right now, what's happening in Ukraine is as frozen as the, as the streets of Moscow here in the middle of the night. The, the truth is, being here in Russia, uh, Ali, that uh, the economy is doing fine. It has moved to a, a war footing. They are uh, many factories uh, producing uh, weaponries and supplies for the, the, the battle in Ukraine. Russia does appear to be prepared to keep going. And at the same time, I think you're seeing President Putin try, try to pivot towards a more, if you like, normal mm. stance. Uh, he's in election campaign mode. Uh, he was out on the world stage again visiting Saudi Arabia just uh, this month. Will he be able to do that? Uh, the incredible thing is that right now that does seem to depend on events in Washington. The other piece of this, too, Kier, listen, you talk about this kind of stalemate, as you phrase it. It is a stalemate that comes at a staggering cost with this new U.S. declassified intelligence assessment finding that 350,000 troops have been either hurt or killed in this war, according to a person familiar with that intel. That's like 90 percent, here of what Russia started off with in the first place. So you talk about Putin trying to get back on uh, a kind of footing that puts him on the international stage more. Where do they see this war going? Are they prepared to fight indefinitely? That's the signs that Russia has been giving. I will say that the independent polling that is available uh, does suggest that the Russian people have, over time, increased their uh, interest in some kinds of of peace talks. In many ways, you talk to Russians on the streets here as the holidays come along and they're just trying to get on with their lives. I mean, we said it many times, Russia is a huge country. For families who have got loved ones uh, in Ukraine, Russian families, of course it's very real, but for many others, uh, you know, it's a very long way away. And uh, I do think that the evidence is that Russia is able to, to simply uh, keep going, uh, albeit uh, there is, you can't, you know, deny uh, that there are are, uh, has been huge implications here in Russia. Just one example, just to think about, Halim, we just take this for granted now, just travelling here yeah. from Europe, you can't fly direct. I mean, there's an iron wall, effectively. You have to go via somewhere else just to get here to Moscow. That kind of thing isn't likely to change. So there have been profound changes for Russia as a result of all this. But at the same time, for many people, the truth is that things feel relatively normal. Hmm. Kier Simmons, live for us there, what looks to be a snowy night in Moscow. Kier, thank you. I will let you go warm up. I appreciate it. I want to bring back Kelly O'Donnell into the conversation because, Kelly, there is obviously the second set of headlines that you referenced earlier here related to where I am right now in this region, and that is Israel's war with Hamas. President Biden late today making a lot of news here. And I will tell you, I heard from even contacts here the second that it happened saying, did you see what President Biden said, suggesting that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is losing support and has to essentially take a harder look at his government. It comes as we're learning that the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, the Defense Secretary, are headed here to the region in the next few days here, at some point this week. The timing here, very interesting too. The UN General Assembly just voted literally in the last couple of hours very much in favor of an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Symbolic only, but the US and Israel, of course, voted against it. That's been consistent for a while. It does hold some political weight, even though it is a vote that is not binding. It doesn't really have any teeth, as what we're seeing in Gaza is becoming even more of a crisis than it already was. Experts, aid organizations sounding the alarm about the situation. Listen. We are witnessing the resumption of violence with a kind of ferocity that one asks, 
what more next? Civilians should never undergo the level of suffering we are currently witnessing. All of this, of course, as there are questions here in Israel about the potential for a temporary truce to happen again and for more hostages potentially to be released, 135 believed to be held in Gaza with the Israeli officials confirming that they believe 19 Israelis have been killed in Gaza, believed to be held in captivity here. I spoke with the family member here in Israel of one of the hostages believed to be held, Kramal Gad, and he talked about his cousin. He talked about how she was leading other captives based on what we heard, what he heard from hostages who were already released, leading them in meditation, leading them in yoga, trying to get their minds to a place where they could simply function while kidnapped. What would another ceasefire mean to him? Here's what he told me. I have to be hopeful because if I'm not hopeful, then I, I have no reason to, to, to keep on waking up at, at, in the morning. But I think that there are reasons to believe that the world understands now how crucial that is. Mm -hmm. And that people in Israel right now, while the fight is going on in Gaza, more and more people understand that they're not gonna the annihilation of Hamas is very important, but it will not be achieved while there are hostages still in the hands of Hamas. So, Kelly, with all that as the backdrop, President Biden is making very clear that he very much supports Israel in its war against Hamas. But he has concerns and has made clear, the Biden administration has made clear those concerns to Israel about protecting innocent Palestinians in their lives as well. We heard that in the news conference. Talk us through that piece of it and what else you're hearing. Well, there were two times in which the president talked about this today. One was earlier in the day at an off-camera fundraiser, and we find that when he speaks at fundraisers, he is often more forthcoming and makes news in those settings. And then by function of having a news conference later in the day and these topics being so uh, much in the national conversation, he addressed it again. And what he is saying is, while the U.S. and he personally are fully in support of Israel's uh, position that it can and must pursue Hamas, uh, that he believes that the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a friend of his for over 50 years, needs to make some changes in the approach. Uh, is at risk of losing support around the world because of uh, indiscriminate, as he described it, uh, bombing. So again, that line of go after Hamas, the president also called Hamas animals in the earlier event at the fundraiser, and is drawing that distinction of legitimate military goals to eradicate uh, Gaza of Hamas. That is the objective to try to keep Israel secure. But the president is again cautioning that the tactics and the approach that Israel is taking is problematic. He also wants to see ultimately a two-state political solution. Uh, self-determination for the Palestinians and, of course, Israel uh, continuing as a free and democratic state. And he is concerned that the conservative government under Benjamin Netanyahu does not support that. And his belief, the president of the United States' belief, is that is the only ultimate solution to uh, these problems and tensions and now outright war between uh, Israel and Hamas needing a political solution. So that's a lot of criticism to deliver to one of the United States' closest friends. Support, but a lot of uh, strong influence and recommendations right. that they need to change in mm -hmm. the midst of their own, their own crisis. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, uh, thank you so much for that great reporting, as always. I so appreciate it from back home in Washington. Also back home in Washington is my friend and colleague Tom Costello, who's got a handle on the many other headlines making news tonight. Tom, good to see you. Hey, Hallie, thank you for your great reporting there. We'll check back with you tomorrow. Uh, let's move on to what's happening here at home. Against the backdrop of two overseas wars, we are learning uh, the embattled president of Harvard is staying, at least for now. The university's board made the announcement today after President Claudine Gay and the presidents of the University of Pennsylvania and MIT drew fierce criticism. Over the controversial testimony they all gave on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on their campuses. Remember, the now former president of the University of Pennsylvania resigned just in the last few days. And still leaving a lot of questions, not just for Harvard, but for college campuses across the country, really struggling with incidents of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and new questions of free speech. In the midst of this war, Antonio Hilton has more. 
Hey, Tom, for days now, rumors, speculation was swirling as these leaders who are part of the Harvard Corporation, the all-powerful governing body of the institution, were getting ready to meet and discuss Claudine Gay's future. But they released a statement to the entire Harvard community today, reaffirming their unanimous support for her in this tumultuous and difficult time. And they made clear that that was going to be part of their message, their, their vision for the future now, as Harvard navigates all these challenging campuses that are on every single college campus across the country right now. And it comes after a groundswell of support. Hundreds of faculty members had signed a letter supporting her and asking the school to essentially send a signal to outside political actors, to major mega donors, that they weren't going to change policy and change leadership because of that kind of outside pressure. And those, those signatures of support, they came from people who actually were angry at Claudine Gay only days ago who had made clear they were dismayed by some of her remarks in that very long hearing, that they felt that she gave, from what I'm hearing in people in the Harvard community, a sort of legal answer to a moral question, and that she could have done a better job of showing support for Jewish students, of very clearly denouncing any possible calls for genocide. But that this, this second chance for her was important, ultimately, to many people in the Harvard community. And that's what we're seeing now. But that doesn't mean that this is the end of the road for troubles for her. We're hearing from Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, for example, that investigations are going to continue. And certainly, because this issue remains such a hot topic on college campuses, we know that college leaders like Claudine Gay are going to be put in these difficult positions where they need to balance students' freedom of speech and their experiences on campus, on campus with the necessity of keeping them safe, Tom. Antonia Hilton, thank you very much. Uh, the judge in Rudy Giuliani's defamation damages trial started the day with a warning to the disgraced attorney that he could face another defamation trial. The warning comes after Giuliani, listen to this, reiterated the same false claims about Georgia election workers Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss that got him charged with defamation in the first place. Here's Giuliani leaving the court just a short time ago. I'm not going to discuss the case uh, right now uh, because it seems to get the judge annoyed. Uh, so we'll discuss it, most of it in the courtroom. Moss took the stand today testifying that she feared for her life in December 2020 as a result of Giuliani's false claims about her. Ryan Riley is joining us now from outside district court in Washington. So, Ryan, he's already admitted at a certain point that, yes, he was wrong, that he made these claims up. And now, today, he's doubling down again. I guess my head is spinning on this, right? And yet we did have emotional testimony from Shea Moss. Yeah, so we doubled down last night, and there was some blowback about that in court today because these claims are false. They are not true. But he was continuing to say that the claims that he made about these individuals were, in fact, true and suggesting that they were involved in some vote switching or something of that nature, which is fundamentally untrue. The dramatic testimony today uh, really took us back to the middle of the COVID era when Shea Moss was really dealing with these extraordinary uh, measures that were being implemented in voting centers across the country, dealing with all of these new absentee ballots that were flooding in. So her job was really busy. And at the same time, of course, she's dealing with her young son at home who's going through a lot of uh, this, uh, you know, remote schooling. And he had to connect through the Internet and sign on for his uh, his various uh, classes. And one of the things he's used, he uses uh, his mother's phone to actually sign on uh, to uh, his his online classes. And when he used that phone, he ended up seeing a lot of these messages that were being sent uh, to Shea Moss. And so they had to actually sit down and talk about all these messages that were incoming, these voice messages. Uh, and so one of the things that Shea Moss uh, testified about today, she said, he didn't deserve that. I had to tell him racism is real. You know, it comes out. I can't even describe it. it f I felt like the worst mom ever to have him hear this, to have to experience that day after day after day. So some really compelling testimony from Shea Moss talking about how this really tore apart her life. Hey, Ruby. Ruby, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Ryan, uh, let me ask you this. You know, Giuliani, again, admitted that he lied, admitted that these were false claims. And then he goes back and doubles down on them again, which makes me wonder, is he setting the stage for an, ins an insanity defense of some sort? Because these were lies about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. He, and, and he's already been found liable in this defamation case. 
why would you go back and then double down on them again when the judge is about to decide, you know, what your penalty is? Tom, I couldn't tell you, you know, insanity is not going to be uh, something that's going to work here, but Rudy Giuliani is pretty broke. So it's a question of whether or not he'll end up, how much he'll be able to actually pay towards what this reward ultimately ends up being coming from uh, the jury here. But, you know, these claims just aren't false. And you got to wonder, you know, is Giuliani really just the, this lost in Internet conspiracy theories, which it appears that he is, or is there some sort of grander strategy here? But ultimately, with all that's come out, it doesn't seem like there is some sort of grand strategy here. And ultimately, there could be a very significant significant uh, finding coming down by the jury here, Tom. Yeah. Ryan Riley, thank you very much. Good reporting. Uh, other news now. We're learning in an NBC News exclusive that the federal government is putting its foot down on car dealer junk fees and scams designed to take more of your money when you go car shopping. If you've been shopping, you know that what we're, this is a real problem, right? You're about to sign for that new car, and then suddenly it costs hundreds, even thousands of dollars more than you expected. Well, the FTC is now rolling out a, quote, new cars rule. It'll require dealers to provide a vehicle's actual price, spelling out optional add-ons and prohibiting what the FTC calls bogus add-ons. This rule is really designed to create some honesty and fair rules of the road so that Americans can buy cars without worrying that they're going to be tricked or scammed. It will take effect in July. In a statement to NBC News, the National Automotive Dealers Association calls this rule a, quote, heavy-handed bureaucratic overreach, adding it is exploring all options on how to keep the ill-conceived rule from taking effect. Tonight, a major climate summit in Dubai that was set to end today is now going into overtime because of some pretty big divisions between countries on how to deal with the issue of fossil fuels, those emissions that contribute to global warming. That disagreement comes just as the summit was focused on a final deal that's supposed to be struck involving all 198 countries. Now, the first draft of the deal drew a lot of heat from climate advocates for not calling for a, quote, rapid phase out of fossil fuels. Instead, it called for a reduction of consumption and production of fossil fuels. Well, that led to some pretty rare protests at the summit. Some protesters saying the whole event is, the, uh, is on the verge, rather, of a complete failure. Right now, many leaders are searching for a way to find a compromise, but they're running out of time. Our Diana Olick has more from Dubai. It is now the middle of the night in Dubai, and we're told there will not be another draft of the COP deal tonight. We really heard very little at all from leadership today. The latest draft released late Monday totally dropped language to phase down or phase out fossil fuels. It just said countries should take action that could include reducing their production and consumption of fossil fuels. This is a major blow to those who expected ambitious action to slow global warming. And so reactions flooded in immediately. Representatives from governments, policy groups, NGOs, one called it alarming that this is something much more amenable to oil and gas producers. Another called the text a nightmare of weak proposals and internal contradictions. Former Vice President Al Gore posted on X that this COP is on the verge of complete failure and that the deal reads as if OPEC dictated it word for word. He went on to say it is deeply offensive to all those who have taken this process seriously. Now the COP28 presidency, which is led by the CEO of the state-owned oil company Adnock called it a huge step forward. To that, one analyst responded, I'm not sure which direction that would be in. Now, there was a protest here this afternoon calling for action on fossil fuels. We haven't really seen that much protesting at all, at least not on the COP grounds, but clearly frustrations are running high now. There have been a lot of agreements here outside of fossil fuels, a side agreement among over 100 nations, including the U.S., to triple renewable energy capacity by 2030. Nations have not raised the 100 billion dollars per year pledged for climate action in developing countries, but they did get here to 83 billion. Now, money was also raised for a loss and damage fund also for developing countries. So everyone awaits the next draft, some wanting to see if the word could in the part that says parties could reduce consumption and production of fossil fuels might be changed to should. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but that is where we are. Back to you. Okay, Diana Olick, thank you very much. Coming up from us, prosecutors are filing charges today in the killing of a Nebraska priest. The new details around his murder coming up next. Plus, why Turkey is indefinitely suspending all soccer games. We're coming back. 
Bottom of the hour, a 158-year-old near total abortion ban on the books in Arizona is now under challenge in that state's Supreme Court. It's a case that will decide which abortion ban the state has to enforce. The 1864 ban that would likely end almost all legal abortions in the state or a 2022 law that bans most abortions after 15 weeks with exceptions for medical emergencies. The sticking point is that the 15-year ban, the 15-week ban, rather, enacted last year does not contain any language about whether it repeals or replaces that 1864 ban. So that ban is still on the books, leaving Arizona with two abortion laws and a lot of confusion. Danny Savalos is joining us now. How did Arizona get here from a legal standpoint? You've got two laws on the books, one dating back to the, the mid-19th century. This is a Gordian knot of what we lawyers call procedure. In other words, uh, this case was in, es in essence pending back before Roe v. Wade in the early 70s. In the state courts, there were debates and fights over whether or not this law was legitimate. And then just two weeks after a major ruling in the state court case, then Roe v. Wade came along. And it's interesting because there, states take differing views of how Roe v. Wade affected existing abortion bans then in existence when Roe v. Wade came down. In other words, did Roe v. Wade simply erase those laws that were on the books? Or while Roe v. Wade existed, and eventually, obviously, it went away, were those laws caged like tigers waiting to come out once Roe v. Wade and Dobbs came out, returning the issue to the states. It's caused a lot of confusion. Arizona is one place where this confusion is running rampant. Added to that is a lower court decision saying that the original law and a later law enacted in 2022 in Arizona must be, and I quote, harmonized, whatever that means. Uh, and a ruling in this case isn't expected until next year. So until that happens, what should women in Arizona do? If, will they have access to abortion or not? Or should they leave the state? Yeah, technically, my understanding is that the 15-week more current ban, the 2022 ban, is what is in effect. But, of course, the arguments from both sides uh, are that one or the other, that the earlier law is in effect, which effectively bans abortion in virtually all situations. So that is the argument they're making. And as soon as the courts can unravel the procedural knot that this case is in, they're going to have to make a decision one way or the other. Yeah. Danny, thank you very much. Danny Savalos. You've heard about this guy. Former Congressman George Santos is appearing for the first time in court since his historic House expulsion earlier this month, with a judge telling him to gear up for a criminal trial that could come as soon as September. That, after news broke overnight, the prosecutors and Santos's legal team are working towards a plea deal in the case. In a filing, lawyers for the government wrote that plea negotiations are focused on, quote, resolving this matter without the need for a trial. If found guilty at trial, Santos faces potentially dozens of years behind bars after two rounds of charges involving multiple allegations of fraud, of money laundering, and identity theft. NBC's Rahim Ellis is following this story for us. Uh, Rahim, about, based on what we saw today and learned overnight, should we be expecting a plea deal or, or a trial sometime next year? I would think that the Santos team would like a plea deal for all of the things that you just said, Tom, and that is if he's found guilty of these 23 counts that he's facing, he could be behind bars for a very long time. Now, the question becomes one of when could a plea deal come and if it will ever come. You point out that currently this case is scheduled to go to trial in September of next year. The government would very like to speed this up into May or June. However, the defense for George Santos says, hold on a minute, because they've got way too much discovery that's been given to them from the prosecution. They say they've received more than 1.3 million pages of documents that they have to sift to. Sift through. He has one lawyer, but he's bringing in other lawyers to help them. In addition, some of this material has been called sensitive, which means that his client has to be with him when he's going through this. Now, they're trying to get some of that desensitized, if you will, and there's, that's going to happen because it seems the prosecution is agreeing. But the judge said this, George Santos is no longer a congressman and will not be going back and forth to Washington for those kind of, of responsibilities. And he's not behind bars. He's not in custody. So she's thinking that they will have an opportunity to sit 
to go through the papers. Whether that means they would be ready for a trial in May or June, that is still not known. But trial is on for September. Now, the other thing we know is that they're coming back in January the 23rd for more status hearing about the nature of where they are in this case. Tom? All right, Rahima, thank you very much. Rahima Ellis in New York. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, prosecutors in Nebraska have charged a man with first degree murder and the deadly stabbing of a Catholic priest. The suspect allegedly broke into the priest's home next to his church. No word on a motive or whether the men knew each other. Back in 2007, the priest pleaded guilty after embezzling more than $100,000 from a church. The county sheriff says he does not think the murder is related to the priest's criminal history. Number two, the trial for rapper Young Thug and five other people is on hold until early next year after one of the defendants was stabbed in the Fulton County Jail just a couple of days ago. He was hit multiple times during a fight. The defendants are on trial for racketeering and gang charges. Number three, a man flew from Denmark to Los Angeles without a passport or a ticket. That according to a criminal complaint, he had Russian and Israeli IDs, but it's unclear what his citizenship actually is. The suspect says he was confused and he could not remember how he managed to board the plane. He could face up to five years in jail if convicted for being a stowaway on a plane. Number four, New York's highest court agreed to allow the state to redraw its congressional map ahead of next year's elections. The redistricting could give Democrats an advantage as they look to take back control of the House of Representatives in New York. Republicans flipped seats in New York last year and warned the legislature is likely to gerrymander the map again. The new map must be filed by the end of February. Number five, someone won 44 million bucks in the Florida lottery. But get this, they never showed up to claim the prize. It happened June 14th, the exp expiration date midnight. So what now? According to state law, 80% of the money will go directly to the state's education funds, and the rest will go to a pool for future prizes. To the economy now, and new data out today shows that inflation is holding steady, not getting any worse. The good news? Gas prices are down, along with what economists call core goods, goods and services other than food and energy. But a rise in shelter costs like rent and mortgages and also used car prices made up for decreases in those other categories. Here's the data point. The November inflation rate, 3.1 percent, is a huge improvement from the peak we saw, more than 9 percent back in June of 2022. Christine Romans is joining us now more with this. Talk us through this report. Sure. This is the 34,000 foot view of the economy, <laughs> but not all consumers are seeing the good news firsthand. Certainly, and it will take time for cooling inflation to really be felt in family budgets because remember, this has been a year and a half of what has been inflation issue number one for American families. So 3.1%, obviously that's an improvement from the worst of it above 9%, but 3.1% is still inflation on top of inflation, right? These are still rising prices overall. And you're right to mention, Tom, that shelter inflation. That's something that has been very sticky, as the economists say. But look, eggs from November last year to this year, an improvement. Gasoline, certainly an improvement. And you have 23 states tonight that have gas below $3 a gallon. So that's important for sentiment and for budgets. Milk, uh, also a little bit cooler. But bread, you're seeing some of the some of the things in the grocery aisle that are, are moving up. Overall, the food category, the food category rising a little bit um, still month to month. But you can see energy there is where the relief has been, Tom. Yeah, I was in Florida yesterday, paid less than $3 a gallon. I thought, well, this yeah. is nice uh, for a change. But listen, let's drill down on something you said, right? It's inflation on top of inflation. Because I looked up the number this afternoon, and a year ago, we were looking at 7% inflation year over year in November. Yep. Now we're at 3.1% year over year. So cumulatively, we're up right. 10% over two years just in November. People feel that. That's real to them. 
And that's the disconnect between economists and wonks like me who say the inflation rate is, the, the, the trend is the right thing here. The trend is your friend. The trend is getting better yep. on inflation. And American families are like, wait a minute. So I'm paying 3.1% on top of the 7% last year? So you're yep. right. There are, there are inflation rates, Tom, and there are price levels. And the price levels keep moving up for what people are paying for a lot of things. Now, the question is, will you start to see some deflation? The Walmart CEO said on some categories, you're going to see deflation into next year, meaning price Prices is falling. Uh, we are seeing some disinflation, which means uh, prices is rising more slowly than they have been. So a lot of this is a lot of, you know, econo speak about yeah. going in the right direction and trying to engineer a soft landing. But American families and a lot of the polls say they don't feel it. There was a University of Michigan uh, survey on Friday. I'm sure you saw it that uh, the Michigan sentiment spiked 13 percent. It's because people said, hey, gas prices are down and I think the inflation story could get better. So maybe with time, people will start to feel it and believe it. If you're talking the Michigan sentiment, you are getting really wonky. I love it, but it's interesting stuff. Uh, Christine, Christine <laughs> Romans, thanks very I put much. I my That's money in the right. swear jar, the economy I, swear jar. <laughs> I know, I'm sense. into it. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> when we come back, police in Spain seized thousands of pounds of cocaine. Where they found that? Coming up later in the global. Some news out of the UK in just the last few hours. A controversial plan to move arriving migrants out of the country and send them to the nation of Rwanda survived a key vote in the British Parliament. It's a huge win for the British Prime Minister, who was staring down a potentially humiliating rebellion from within his Conservative Party, with some saying the plan was too harsh and others arguing it's too lenient. It's just the latest development in the years-long plan to try to discourage migrants from making the trip all the way to Europe and then across the English Channel in small, rickety boats like the one you're seeing right there. If the plan is set in action, it would put migrants who arrived illegally on a one-way flight to Rwanda, which has agreed to take in the asylum seekers in exchange for hundreds of millions of dollars. It all hit a snag last month, though, when the British Supreme Court ruled the flights would be a violation of both British and international law, ruling that Rwanda was an unsafe destination for the migrants. Now, with the number of asylum seekers skyrocketing in recent years, the prime minister seems to have successfully revived the law, at least for now. NBC's Matt Bradley is covering this for us from London. Uh, Matt, I kind of follow this from afar, wonder whether it was going to actually happen. Break it down for us and what it means for, for the migrants who have really been surging into Britain. Yeah, Tom, I mean, it looks kind of wild from kind of a human rights, you know, legal standpoint. And it won't be difficult for our viewers to see how and why this plan has become so controversial. But after today's vote, a lot of the obstacles, though not all of them, left before it becomes the law of the land have kind of disappeared. And so the idea behind this proposal is that migrants who seek asylum by entering the UK illegally, many of whom have crossed the English Channel by those rickety boats you were just talking about, they'll be sent to Rwanda on a one-way plane ticket, and that's where they'll live for good if their asylum applications for Rwanda are successful. And the UK will pay all of those asylum seekers living expenses for five years. So basically, if you're looking to claim asylum in the UK, you will be rerouted to Rwanda, where essentially you could be spending the rest of your life if you get asylum in Rwanda. Now, this bill, it's mostly aimed at stopping those migrants who are trying to get across into the UK by crossing the channel illegally, often taking their lives, into their own hands. And the main point here isn't just expelling those migrants from British shores, it's also to discourage them from making the journey in the first place. That's the crux of this plan. And it was only last year that the number of migrants crossing into the United Kingdom over the English Channel spiked to its highest ever level, climbing toward 50,000 all year long. Now, that figure declined a bit last year. As you can see, the figures appear to be going up as the years go on. Tom? Uh, and, and listen, of course, Britain isn't the only country that has seen this influx of migrants. France has, Belgium has, I mean, all across the core of Europe. Could this, in fact, uh, be a trend that spreads? Could other countries say, well, Britain is going to pay Rwanda to take our migrants. We'll, we'll pay them, too, or we'll pay some other country. Yeah, I mean, that's a really big question, right? The question is, this plan has to work for people to want to do that, for other countries to want to take this up. And this has been very politically fraught for all of the reasons I just described. You know, the proposal, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, moral politics around this are very clear. The idea that the UK would send asylum seekers who themselves, let's remember, 
are claiming to be, be the victims of human right. rights abuses to a third country. Now, that seems fraught with humanitarian peril, especially when we're talking about a country like Rwanda, which doesn't necessarily pass all of the main tests of whether or not it's a safe country to live in. Remember that genocide back yeah. uh, in 1994? There's still a lot of political tumult. There's wars in the neighboring countries. And even though it is a developing country, it still doesn't have a lot of the safeguards that a lot of those people, again, who are escaping persecution in other countries, went to Britain in order to escape. They probably didn't want to end up in a country yeah. like Rwanda. Yeah, anti-gay laws in Rwanda as well. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. Matt Bradley in London for us. Coming up, why a consumer group is pushing the FDA to put stronger warnings on Botox and similar injections. A look at what the risks could be after the break. You know, we have a big job here. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories each day. And because it's impossible to read, watch, or listen to all of it, our international teams have done it for you and for me. So here are some of the things they're keeping an eye on. The segment is called The Global. In Spain, authorities say they have discovered more than 15,000 pounds of cocaine hidden inside a shipment of frozen tuna. Police say the drugs came from South America. They also found thousands more pounds of the stuff in separate busts. 20 people have been arrested in connection with those smuggling operations. In Poland, we're getting a look at the video of a far-right lawmaker causing confusion and outrage. Look at him there, using a fire extinguisher to put out Hanukkah candles during a celebration in the country's parliament building. Afterwards, he went to the parliament chamber and he called the Hanukkah menorah satanic. The parliament speaker then kicked him out of the proceedings and said he would inform prosecutors about the case. And in Turkey, authorities have arrested the president of a top soccer club after he punched a referee at the end of a match. The official ended up in the hospital. The country's soccer federation put a pause on all league play indefinitely because of that. Tonight, consumer advocacy, advocacy group Public Citizen is calling for stronger Botox warnings and others like it. The group has filed a petition with the FDA today asking it to require more strict warnings along with the treatments, letting people know of the risk that comes with using these, including a potential fatal muscle paralyzing disease. Folks get these injections for a whole bunch of reasons, They're erasing wrinkles, treating migraines, even reducing sweating. And they already have a warning on the labels, but this group says it's not strong enough. We reached out to all of the companies mentioned in the petition for comments. So far, one of them responded. Merce Aesthetics writes in part that its product, Zeomen, has been FDA approved as a safe and effective treatment option for more than a decade. And as always, MERS Aesthetics' top priority is ensuring the safety of our products for the patients we serve. We want to bring in NBC doctors uh, Kavita Patel. Let's bring in Dr. Kavita Patel, who is going to give us some lowdown on this. How dangerous are these products? We've had a debate in the newsroom today. Would you or should you let somebody you know and love close to you, maybe a 20 something, would you should you let them do this? Tom, I think it depends. So one thing is true, that there are thousands of injuries that come from these injections. And botul like botulinum toxin, Botox injections, yeah. is a toxin that's injected that actually paralyzes the muscle. That's why you get that relaxing of lines, and that's why people use it for wrinkles. But as you mentioned, lots of other medical uses for it. Some are really critical. People who are using it for migraines and other bladder disorders, that is something they critically depend on. So I think we have to separate kind of the medical necessity from times when when potentially people don't need it. But we have over 3.6 million Americans using it every year. So this was our discussion today. And, you know, so often people, we, we, people start going down the road of treatments right. or having some injection or, some, or taking some treatment. Right. And then 10 years later, you find out, There's boy, that was a mistake. Right. Yeah, there are side effects that you, we didn't know about. Right. So what, what do you tell your patients? Uh, I, I, this is something very common. And I do tell them that when it's done properly by someone trained to do this, and I think that's critical, that it is an incredibly safe procedure, but it is a medical procedure. When it's applied locally, especially for the use in cosmetics, it doesn't get into the system. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what Public Citizen is trying to warn, yeah. that there can be cases where it does get in the system. Uh, I'm aware of a dentist that does this, yeah, offers this right. treatment. He is not a medical doctor, he's a dentist. And right. I'm thinking, 
boy, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. And it's also gotten popular with younger people on yes. social media. It's kind of gone viral on social media. Yeah, it's licensed and approved for 18 and above, but I know that there are 20 something year olds who have been using it on social media. I think the critical thing here, there's never the right age to use it. It's really about the conversation of the context to use it. Preventing wrinkles is something that a lot of people are trying to pursue, but often just wasting a lot of money for. So yeah. I think that's why we have to make sure that we're using it appropriately. It's done by a trained professional and that you're aware of some of these potential side effects like the muscle paral right. paralysis and some of the nerve problems that could come from it. So uh, about the 20 somethings who are doing it, yeah. their argument has been, I've had two 20 something daughters who tell me, <laughs> it, you want to get ahead of the curve. You want to get ahead and stop the wrinkles before right. they appear. Right. It's, it's, it's certainly a very, look, as a woman who would love to get ahead of all sorts of processes of aging, I think it's a very valid notion. However, I think that there are times when you're too young for it. And what you're trying to do is identify the time when you can actually prevent that deepening of those lines, mm. which are there. What I tell most patients is those lines were probably there. They were finer than you think. But if you don't have them, do not stress about them and just be happy with what you have and feel good about it. And that's what doctors tell you all the time. And I believe it. <laughs> I like that advice. All right. Yes. Dr. Patel, thank you thank very you. much. We appreciate it. Uh, still to come from us, why baseball superstar Shohei Otani's blockbuster $700 million deal with the Dodgers is not necessarily what it looks like in the headlines. We're getting into the unusual details coming up next. All right, have you heard about this? Uh, that record-setting deal for one of ba the biggest players in baseball ever in the Major League. Well, it's not exactly what it seems. Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Dodgers just reached that stunning agreement for that two-way star to make a whopping $700 million to play for 10 years. But Otani won't see most of that money for another decade. NBC's Noah Pransky is uh, posted uh, at the big board to explain all of this. All right, Noah, break it down for us. The headline doesn't tell the full story. No, I mean, I think we need to start with why this guy will be the highest played, paid player ever. He's basically the second coming of Babe Ruth, a two-way star, all-star pitcher, all-star hitter. And you compare him to Babe Ruth, 701 games into his career, he's got more home runs than Ruth did. He has more pitching strikeouts than Ruth did. Totally impressive two-time MVP player. His contract, though, was equally impressive to baseball insiders because he agreed to defer almost all of his salary. His next 10 years, while he is under contract to the Dodgers, he'll only be making $2 million a year. Now, we should point out he makes a ton of money on endorsements. Set that aside, though, he said, I want my team to have more money to be able to go sign better players. So he deferred the bulk of it. He'll get $68 million a year the 10 years after his deal expires each one of those years. Now, we also should point out this is interest-free money. So, you know, when you talk to an accountant, when you figure out how he's actually, like how much is this actually worth, it actually is a little closer to $46 million a year over the course of this deal. But still, Tom, not bad money. Wouldn't mind it in my paycheck. I don't know how you're going to get by in $46 million instead of the original, whatever that right. was, $68 million. Listen, real quickly, I'm all for everybody trying to get whatever they can get, right? But what do we pay firefighters? What do we pay teachers? What do we pay, for that matter, ER doctors? I mean, this seems out of whack. So the argument is, with so much money pouring into sports, would you rather the money go to the millionaires or the owners, the billionaires? And baseball players say they're just tracking along with the owners. In fact, the average baseball salary, about $5 million a year now, it's doubled in the last 20 years. But the average team value has gone up almost sevenfold in the last 20 years. So the owner's doing just fine and the players keep fighting for a bigger cut. Now, you may say, this is crazy. What can we do so that teachers and firefighters are paid more like athletes? Well, there is something you can do. Local taxpayers, local politicians could stop putting money into pro sports. $33 billion, according to recent research, has gone in the last 50 years to pro stadiums. That's 73% of the cost of basically funding the venues for all of these sports. And it looks like every week, Tom, we see another yeah. city ready to give big time money. Wouldn't you know, just today, the voters in Oklahoma City are going to the polls to decide whether to give close to a billion dollars to their basketball team for a new arena there. It's your tax money and mine. Noah, thank you very much. Noah Pransky. Yeah. That is a wrap for this hour. Uh, as you would expect, the news continues right now. 
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.